the clans. It was the private owner and Arnold that evolved in making it in a vicious situation. And in practice, But until now, there is a strong pressure by the population to the policy makers to make a uh, restoration of society. Because in many cases, the, the people that uh, know their life were in a forest environment, and then you have huge forests, and they know that for the rest of their life, their environment could never, never be a, a, any more a forest. So they make a strong political pressure to make restoration and Yeah, Yes. This is the general question about Native American burning. Um, I'm just curious what the rationale was to consider it natural, especially what we learned yesterday about the fact that we had invasive species that they didn't have to deal with back then. So I'm wondering how that fits into the restoration scheme. Some cases, 
when they go to the field, they have just to prepare to overcome the, the drought that's going to be for sure in the summer. Okay, and then on one of the slides you had that the, uh, the seedlings are started in paper and then metal and plastic. What was? No, no, this, uh, well, we started in this deep container, we started using, preparing ourselves the materials. Now it's a company producing in Portugal, producing these uh, containers with this uh, plastic container. Uh -huh. yeah. Well, there was, but there was writing on one of the slides that said papel. And do you remember that one? Sorry? There was a, one of your slides you had written on there, papel. Like they started, it was looked like the ceiling had been started on paper. Was that just germinated on, on a paper towel? On paper? I don't know. Yeah, maybe we can go through slides later. It's for, for lunch. We have lunch. <laughs> <laughs> You're having me show on this presentation. I saw it here before. Okay. I have a question for Megan and Katie. Megan, are you planning on replicating your research from the next couple of years? And if so, do you think that? For each year, you will need to reapply the herbicides. So, the study that we're doing, it's actually a two year study. This is just the results so far. We still have another year that we're going to be working out there. And we've been discussing follow up treatments for um, with the herbicide. So, we're discussing that. In the future, we're going to be doing it too. And, Katie, I was wondering if you see any opportunities on the Angels for doing something similar because. Your emphasis has been on restoration for sites that um, are disturbed and, and you're trying to restore the vegetation as opposed to Megan where they're trying to reverse some type of type conversion. So do you see opportunities on the Angelus? Heck yeah. <laughs> <laughs> of course. Yeah, I mean, if we're going to start talking about working in type conversion areas, which for us would be a lot of the bromes and mustard, influenced areas, we have to have herbicides to be effective. <coughs> and there's, there's no question about that. And then the last question, is there any location, this is like for, for both of you guys, um, are there any locations where you would look at a site and say, here's a criteria for de determining a site that has potential for restoration, uh, restoring a site from type conversion, and these are the criteria where we look at a site and we say, this is beyond um, what we think is reasonably um, viable as a restoration site. Um, well, I've actually been discussing this same question with my boss up on the San Bernardino. And what, it's, there's no protocol, there's nothing, this is just in discussion. And I think the way to maybe prioritize areas would have to do it with federally listed species that would be present in the area? Is it habitat for those? Is it going to be, are those areas damaging watersheds that have other federally listed species? I think that's where the priority is going to be starting. But like I said, that's just a discussion. There's, that's as far as I know a lot about. So. I would add to that that, you know, in terms of when you're looking at a site and thinking, is this too far gone? You know, you want to be looking for places probably to start that have remnant native cover, at least some native cover left. And you also want to be looking at, is this a site that's going to be constantly disturbed by, for us it's OHV, or you know, it's right next to a road, or, or you know, the list goes on and on for disturbances. And you want to choose those sites that have a fighting chance of making it instead of throwing money down the drain on some sites that just are always going to be disturbed, are always in the path of OHV or something like that. Um, Megan, did you have any, uh, well, I, I gather you're going to continue with your experiments. Um, one thing that's important to everybody doing restoration, I'm hearing, and Jamie's the only one to talk about it, is the site weather on the site is very important over time. And have you had any kind of weather station at your site so you can see if there's a change in something suddenly germinates that you weren't expecting? You would know it was because some rainstorm came along and hung right over there and rained right there when it may not have rained anywhere else. So I don't have one stationed at the site. However, there's a station in Beaumont just maybe 
four or five miles down the road that I monitor because that's the closest one to our research area. There's a couple other weather stations that I monitor, one in Redlands and one in Moreno Valley, because in, the, in this specific area, in the canyon, the weather can differ very much from, from one end to the other. So I, I keep an eye on precipitation at, on the various locations around my site. So that's how I'm monitoring that and keeping track of the precipitation as well as the temperatures out there. Well, CNTS wants to encourage research. And so um, one of the things we're, we're really finding out is because the weather in the mountain ranges is so variable over any distance whatsoever that you really need to start thinking uh, when you ask for money, getting a little weather station there that will track humidity, maybe something that will tell you what is actually happening on that site and not too far away. But uh, the other thing is, um, Katie, uh, I think you deserve a medal for the reading you've been doing. <laughs> standing up there telling us all the things you've done. I know, I get all the glory and they do all the work. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, uh, I think listening to all of you, you can tell that the, one of the basic, or maybe the major, maybe even the cheapest restoration tool is weeding. Amen, sister. <laughs> Sorry, we don't have two microphones. You do. Okay, I'll come back. Yeah. 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 yeah, Katie, this uh, has to do with the uh, use of herbicides. And uh, you know, one of the downsides is they'll you know, take out natives as well as non-natives. But there is, there is a difference between natives and non-natives that you might be able to take advantage of, and that is that the non-natives mostly come from the Mediterranean, and even though it has a Mediterranean climate like ours, it's actually quite different in terms of precipitation regimes. They tend to have a peak in the fall, whereas our rains peak in the winter. And the, most of the weeds come up in the, in the fall, right after the first rains. And it may be possible to hit them in the fall with herbicides uh, and potentially not affect non natives. There is a little bit of data to suggest that works. Carl Bell did an experiment he, uh, trying to eradicate uh, Brassica nigra, and he hit it in the fall, and it was very effective. So it might be worth playing with the, the timing of, of application. Yeah, we're, we're starting to do that. And we've even seen as early as, you know, or as late as, as January, you know, that that's even before a lot of the native annuals are coming up. So yeah, early is, is very key, because yeah, you don't want to, especially in the early stages of restoration, you don't want to be spraying on top of your little tiny native seedlings. But that's why we're also trying to really get on board with the, the grass-specific herbicides, because that's our biggest competitor in these restoration sites, so that we can spray over the native forest. Yeah, we, uh, we used a grass-specific herbicide in a project once, and we have the best uh, star <laughs> Being on the low spiders, we have obviously a lot of fires, and we look at fuel break strategies to mitigate, stop, minimize the size of the fires. And we've been doing a lot of mastication, going in, um, masticating some of the chaparral areas. And one of the things I'm hearing is the biggest issue is invasive weeds coming in. And if masticating is promoting that, then do we need to move back instead of doing a fuel break, which modifies the fuel behavior, do we need to come in and put in permanent fire breaks, which is gonna look like the dozer lines to do it with a aggressive herbicide program to keep the invasives out. Um, what's your thoughts on that, considering what's your biggest priority, weeds or chaparral? I know there's soil issues. You know, one thing that you have to keep in mind, I think, with those fuel breaks is that they are huge vectors for feed spread. 
<clears throat> mostly, especially when a fire does come through, that the weeds filter off very quickly off of that line. Um, so I don't know if that gets, you know, that's one piece of the puzzle when you're thinking about doing your field treatments. Um, and mastication, maybe as part of doing your field rate maintenance, you have to start incorporating more herbicide use to control your non-native, especially grasses and mustards and the like. But you also, you know, if you are going to, you know, the flip side is, you know, moving to areas that, like, we had a picture of where it's, it's already been a field break that's been defined by a, a do dozen line because if it was a contingency line for a fire. Maybe really concentrating on, you know, letting your buckwheats and all that stuff, the low growing, it's changing its native plants, but you're changing the fuel stature of those. So maybe you could look at some seeding techniques like for imprinting, like I was talking about, broadcast seeding is not very effective in arid landscapes, but doing something like imprinting could work pretty well on dozen lines. Just a, a comment, kind of. Um, it's great what we're doing, and it sounds like <clears throat> controlling weeds and basic weeds is probably the most, one of the most important restoration things we can do. And yet, the Angeles has the whole station fire, which now is not covered by NEPA. So it, it's like NEPA is this huge barrier. And so I would encourage any money that we have to get that NEPA done as quickly as possible, especially for restoration. There's no public outcry against herbicides for restoration. Um, we did the Santa Clara Mojave NEPA, the um, San Gabriel Canyon NEPA. Um, we're doing a big one on a whole watershed on the San Bernardino, and people aren't opposed to it, and especially for restoration. So my thought would be is do forest-wide restoration NEPA. Uh, no one's gonna fight you on it, and, and limit it to the few herbicides that you think are really critical to doing restoration, and I think it would go very well. And uh, I have thoughts if anybody wants to talk about that sometime. No comments, huh? <laughs> when you're talking about herbicide, are you talking about broad scale herbicide? Or are you talking about someone in a backpack sprayer squirting plant by plant? And that would go to either end person. So for our study area, our plots are relatively small. So we have um, Chris McDonald's been doing, applying the herbicide out there. And that's with a backpack sprayer because it's a lot easier to work on the slopes for the backpacks for it and the long hose or anything like that. And just since our sites are so small, that's easier for us, for our study at least. I think, I think the public would be having heart attacks if we were doing aerial spraying <laughs> of herbicides. So no, it's all a very, you know, source point backpack is the biggest sort of spray equipment that we have on the Angeles. So in that case, is it possible to spray and miss the natives? I mean, well, I mean, from my experience, my my crew has done that. They target the weeds and miss the natives, and after two years, you notice that. Um, and so it hasn't killed off the natives, and we've used glyphosate and a thistle-specific herbicide. So is that a possibility? I mean, I know it's labor-intensive, but to do that. Are you talking about for restoration sites or like the type converted sites? Either one. It could be the type converted after you plant it. Yeah, I think it's possible, especially if we can get that grass specific herbicide online to use on the forest. That would be it's definitely possible. And like John was talking about, it's all about timing too. I think we have about five more minutes or so if we want to take advantage of that. So of course, I just noticed that. Huge pile of cookies over here that Karina Roberts baked, and I'm eating them as I'm walking around. So they're, not getting well. <laughs> they're even homemade. Oh, oh. Yeah, so, so just a question: hearing the you know the weeds and the water, and, and I'm amazed actually on a forest scale that you could even consider doing restoration with artificial irrigation. I mean, you know, it's such a significant factor in the chaparral community to make resilient plant communities that can be self-sustaining. So I, I'm kind of just curious as to the rationale as to why you would continue to budget and maintain an irrigation system on a restoration. 
And, and that goes for the, the gentleman from Spain as well, because I'm curious as to what you do with irrigation. We don't use irrigation. We never use irrigation for restoration. Okay. But I mean, in North Africa they do. In the neighborhood, uh, yeah, close to the Sahara Desert. But not in our case. Because it would, it would be unacceptable socially. No one would accept it. Use what for irrigating the wildlife. Yeah. <laughs> right. no, so, so that's why we try to make all these research efforts to uh, improve water use efficiency of all the things not using. In addition, uh, they get in large areas or remote areas where it's possible. To do. And another difference is the use of herbicides. Well, we don't have problems, this big problem you have here of uh, these uh, exotic invasive grasses. But we are, in principle, very reluctant to use herbicides in the, in the environment for the potential uncontrolled attacks in water. So, but I mean, we don't use them. Even for, in some spots, we have some exotics that are like uh, the Alundodonax, for example. We don't use herbicides. We we'll try to skip using the herbicides. And I think it's kind of cultural, technical, historical reasons that we don't do that. Shall so, like, the places that we do use watering are only alongside roads, and it only goes in maybe. 100 feet, we're not talking large scale watering. And like I said, we, we did start off doing some surface watering and we're trying to move away from that to use deep pipes so it's much, much more efficient. Um, what we found is just it's without doing ir any irrigation, <coughs> things are not so successful. We are gradually paring that down to, to kind of find experimenting on what that threshold is. And I think it's a lot less than what we have started with. But for container plantings, which really are going to give you the most bang for the buck, trying to meet a success criteria of plant cover. Container plants are the way to go and for right now, given especially our drought conditions, we have to do some water. Okay, that'll be the last one. Okay, this is our last question. Um, thank you for your presentations. Uh, I'm not sure how to ask this, uh, so I'm just gonna go for it. The, um, for, as someone who's here to learn about uh, fire management on the National Forest, I'm wondering, based on the Angeles and the difficulties you're having uh, with restoration of post-fire sites and the amount of money and resources that are going into sort of this Sisyphusian pushing the rock up the hill. Um, and the question that you asked about uh, what's better uh, on the fuel break, looking back, are there areas that are sort of clear now uh, in hindsight that basically would have been better in the long run just not to have done anything with, in terms of getting in and doing fuel breaks and, uh, you know, areas you were saying, prioritizing restoration in areas that are hard to get to, uh, where OHV isn't gonna continually degrade it, places that have the best chances. Are there areas that we can start parsing out that, hey, maybe, it would have been better just to leave that alone and focus on this. Now, so I'm just speaking as someone who's never been on the ground fighting a fire, but just looking at the problems that come afterwards and maybe looking back in hindsight now that we have this map and where, where it was, what we tried to do, and now what we're left to clean up. Yeah. 
that sounds encouraging. Do you have any sense whether that model will reduce the the the, uh, the vector issue? I mean that that model will be less of uh, a possibility for invasives um, to get in versus what's currently being uh, right. implemented. Right now, what happens is we open up the nozer lines and then we widen them out. And so, if we don't have to widen them out so much, then that will hopefully reduce the, the vector spread of the um, of, of the invasive species. But you know, you got to. Let's give all of our speakers a big round.